Welcome to another edition of Around Town, where we focus in on the people and places that affect your community. I'm Larry Seaman, your host, and today we're at Whittier Birthplace in Haverhill, Massachusetts. And uh, we're going to have uh, a little bit of a talk with Renee Hallow, who's the curator here. And, of course, we'll take a little bit of a tour. So join us. Give us a little bit of a history on the property. At the time that uh, Thomas Whittier built this house, he built it in 1688. This area between the village of Amesbury and Haverhill was still very much a wilderness. And so there was not another house within sight when Thomas built the house. Even in Whittier's day, when he was a boy living here, he said that you couldn't see so much as the smoke from another chimney from their house when he was a boy. So they were very secluded. Wow. But the house is over 300 years old. It was built by Thomas, who was the great, great grandfather of the poet. Makes the poet the fifth generation of his family to live here. And how many children were there at the time of uh, John Greenleaf Whittier? Well, if we go all the way back to when the house okay. was built, right. because there's been a lot of little pitter-patters of feet in this house. <laughs> Thomas had ten children. Wow. His youngest son, Joseph, took over the farm next, had nine children. <laughs> His youngest son, Joseph II, took over next, had eleven children. But by the time the poet was a boy here, there were only four children in the family. He had an older sister, Mary. Then came the poet, John Greenleaf. His younger brother, Matthew Franklin. The family called him Frank. And the youngest was Elizabeth. Hmm. But in addition to the four children, there were four adults living here in the poet's time. The parents, the mother's unmarried sister, Aunt Mercy, and the father's unmarried brother, Uncle Moses. And if you read the poem Snowbound, you'll get to meet all of these people. Oh, that's true, that's yeah. true. And uh, let's see, let's talk a little bit about uh, the family itself, uh, how the religion was. Uh, the Whittiers were Quakers that came into the family, the second generation. Joseph Whittier married Mary Peasley of the mm -hmm. Peasley Garrison House, and that's when they began to be Quakers. And they were very faithful to that uh, through the next generations. Whittier himself was um, always attributed to his being able to clearly see social injustice to his time spent in the Quaker meeting house sitting in silence. Mm. So he was very much the Quaker, yes. And talk a little bit about his poetry. His poetry, uh, he began writing poems at a very early age, uh, 13, 14 years old, after hearing a teacher of his read to them from Robert Burns. Uh, he loved the poems, began to try and write his own, uh, unfortunately, he loved Burns so much he was trying to mimic him, right oh, down to I the see. Scottish oh, yeah. dialect. So yeah. a 12-year-old Quaker farm boy writing poems with a Scottish <laughs> dialect. He later destroyed those poems, saying they were too <laughs> juvenile. But he was just rabid about writing poems. He wrote poems every free moment, and even some not free moments. He was known to hide in the attic or out in the field and be writing poetry instead of doing his chores. So um, by the time he's 18 years old, though, his sister takes one of his poems from his hiding place in the attic without telling him, <laughs> sends it to a newspaper in Newburyport, the Free Press, and the editor was William Lloyd Garrison. And they had a regular feature in this paper of a poetry page. And so his sister sent the poem, signing it W of East Haverhill, and Garrison liked the poem and printed it. So that was the first printing of the poet's uh, poems. It was called The Exile's Departure. But he had no idea that she had done this. Yeah. So he was out in the field with his father mending one of the stone walls when the man rides by and tosses the paper. He immediately opens to the poetry page, <laughs> his favorite page, and there's his poem in print. Wow. He couldn't believe it. He stood there frozen long enough that his father had to yell at him, Greenleaf, get back to work. <laughs> so he would fold the paper up, put it in his pocket, but every five or ten minutes he had it out again, just staring at it, and his father would yell again. Apparently this went on all day long. He said he never actually read a word on the page. He just stared at it there. <laughs> so his sister was encouraged. He liked having his poems printed. And so this time, with his permission, she began to send more. And Garrison continued to print them. And so that was when the poet was 18. Over the next two years, he has over 80 poems and pieces of prose that are published in newspapers all around. Mm -hmm. Now these are uh, just reader submissions. They're not things that he was getting paid for at that time. Eventually, though, um, he gets a job as a newspaper editor, which in fact is how he earned his living most of his life, not as a poet, but as right. a newspaper editor. And, and was that the Haverhill Gazette? Uh, no, to start or out, he was uh, started in Boston in a paper called The American Manufacturer. Uh, it was a paper having to do with tariffs and promoting American-made goods over British goods. Mm. 
And so that's where he learned the newspaper business. Uh, later on, he was at the Gazette. Yeah. And um, so the majority of his early poems then were um, actually sort of editorial comment. They were poems with the intent of them responding to a current event. They were just printed in the paper for that purpose. It wasn't until later in his life, um, after abolition, uh, after emancipation finally comes, after working for this for 30 years, plus 30 years, um, that he becomes reflective. And he says he wants to write a poem about his mother and his sister because his sister died the same year as the Emancipation Proclamation, wow. and they had lived together all their lives. And so when he sits down to write that poem, he says he can't separate his memory of those two women's, women from his memories of being a boy around this fireplace. Yeah. That's when he wrote Snowbound, his most famous poem ever. During the period where he was a newspaper editor, he never made much money. He was quite poor. He never made more than four or five hundred dollars a year. When Snowbound was first released in 1866, he made ten thousand wow. dollars on the first wow. printing. Unbelievable amount of money. But if you consider the state of America at the time that this was released, people were tired from the fighting from the Civil War. They were wounded physically and emotionally. And he writes this lovely poem about growing up as a boy on this farm. Mm. And so it was salve for wounded America. It made them feel good. It was an instant hit. And if anybody has seen or read uh, Snowbound, it does give a really detailed uh, accounting of what it was like to uh, live at that time and also about his family. That's great. Yes, it's a, it's a wonderful poem because you get to meet each individual, each member of the family, and you meet them through the stories that they're telling and sharing with each other while they're actually snowed in here during the blizzard of 1818. Mm -hmm. So it's based in an actual event. What kind of poetry w did he write? I mean, uh, you know, as far as uh, tempo and, you know, that kind of thing. Typically the style of the day, sometimes he would write a poem to the same meter of another poem that he had read, and so he would try to fit the rhyming in uh -huh. with uh, something that was already in existence. He wrote things that could be considered like a call and response type ballad thing, so it really varied. Uh -huh. And um, But his early poems during the abolitionist period were, uh, he was a rabble rouser. His intent was to make people angry. He was appealing to the heartstrings when he wrote the poem about the slave mother watching her two daughters being auctioned to two separate families. His intent was for people to be angry about how unfair that was. And so a large number of those poems were, um, he was there to stir things up, yeah, to yeah. make people think.